Hello, everybody, and welcome to One Sustainability. I am James Rosenstein, a member of the advisory board of One Business World. One Sustainability features entrepreneurs, founders, and business leaders who have sustainability as a core component of their overall strategy, presenting on cutting edge topics and the latest industry developments. Our goal is to educate and inform the global business and entrepreneurial communities on the importance of sustainability and to promote and support sustainable business growth all around the world. Today, we're very pleased to welcome leading global sustainability entrepreneur, Henry Gordon Smith. And if you have any questions for him, please list them in the Q&A section in Zoom. Henry is the founder and CEO of Agritecture. Agritecture was founded to help entrepreneurs navigate the crucial planning stage for their urban farming business and avoid costly mistakes. Agritecture has grown into the world's leading advisory firm on urban and controlled environment agriculture, working with clients of all types, from entrepreneurs to investors, to technology providers in more than 25 countries. Henry is an acknowledged global thought leader in the accelerating vertical and urban agricultural industry and has facilitated, moderated, and spoken at sustainability-driven forums and events worldwide. Henry, it is a great pleasure to have you here with us today to hear more about why cities must act now on making their food systems resilient to climate change. Thank you and welcome to One Sustainability. Thank you so much, James, for that introduction. And thank you to One Sustainability for hosting me for this talk. Whether you're watching live online or watching the recording, we're so happy you're here and we look forward to illuminating your mind on urban agriculture, resilience, and cities. And definitely, we want to get questions from you, um, either live or as a follow-up. So as was mentioned, I'm Henry Gordon Smith. You can find me on social media or email me directly if you have questions after the presentation today. And today, we're talking about cities and why cities are so important to drive resiliency forward, and particularly why food is such an important part of that, and why there is no time better than now to start to act and to be more resilient. So a little bit about me, as was mentioned, I'm an ag tech consultant. I, I speak all around the world in this topic. I've actually reached you know, six continents that I've spoken on this topic about. So that's pretty much everywhere. I'm a nomad, I'm currently in Rome, um, but I travel around the world visiting farms, visiting our clients, visiting my employees that are spread around the world and speaking at incredible events like this. We are consultants, so that means that we answer questions for anyone, anywhere, looking to understand their next step, looking to get the data they need to understand how to navigate the challenges of sustainable agriculture. And I also manage an incredible global team, as I mentioned, with team members in Croatia, Amsterdam, California, New York. We're spread all around the world, but we're still quite a, a tight knit small team. And you can learn more about that on our website and see my amazing team members. A little bit about agriculture before I begin, because I think it'll help you understand the context of where we're coming from this, uh, coming from to solve this challenge. So we really believe that cities in particular are the place where the innovation happens. That's where the next generation is. That's where people want to live. We've crossed the mark with more of the world's population living in cities than before. And we really believe that cities are where the leadership in agriculture is actually going to happen. Now, that may surprise you. But in the end, cities really have to drive this forward. And one of the great challenges is that cities actually don't know a lot about agriculture. Historically, they were, the play, they were built around areas where agriculture was. But as we sort of advanced through the Green Revolution, we had this ability to sort of move agriculture elsewhere and just basically import the food we wanted and ship it around the world. But now in the face of climate change, we need to react. So our mission is to really help accelerate climate smart strategies 
not only to mitigate climate change, but to adapt to it because it is inevitable and it is coming and it's getting worse. And growing food closer to the consumer, closer to where people are and innovating on that in an urban way is one of the ways we can do this. So there's our mission and vision for you, which is bold and something we are very committed to. Now, agriculture has very humble roots. I actually started blogging about urban agriculture in my dorm room while at the University of British Columbia studying political science and environmental security. And I really wanted to create a place where people could learn about this topic in an open, honest and transparent way. And the blog got really popular because people all around the world wanted to know how do greenhouses work? How do rooftop farms work? What about this new trend of vertical farming? How does this all come together? And agritecture.com became the leading blog for this topic. And we have a commitment to transparency and honesty to really help people navigate the challenges of understanding the technology and the business models for this sector. Now in 2014, my audience started requesting consulting from me. So I got a couple different leads. The first lead was a special needs school out of Baltimore that was a private school that wanted to help youth with developmental challenges understand the food system, grow some of their own food and learn the skills around food safety. So that was a really exciting project where we designed an in-classroom vertical farm and a curriculum called Growing Futures. And that was at the Phillips Programs Academy just outside of Baltimore. But in the same week, I was contacted by Deloitte in the Middle East and they had an unused building and they wanted to know how much food could they grow in this building? They were doing a feasibility study and no one was providing that data separate from selling equipment. So I said, hi, here's an opportunity, right? We could be a technology agnostic global consultancy that answers people's questions and helps them formulate their wild ideas about agriculture into realities. Now we've been doing the consulting since 2014. I'll show you some of our impact in a moment. But in 2020, we decided we wanted to go further. And we had a lot of people who didn't necessarily feel like they were fit for consulting. Maybe they had sticker shock or maybe they wanted to do more of the work on their own. So we created Agritecture Designer which I'll also show you a little bit of that later today. But Agriculture Designer is the world's first farm planning software. You can log in, you can input your location, you can input your budget, you can input what crops you wanna grow, and you can get a very quick estimate of the capital cost, operational cost, yield, jobs, and main economic variables of any greenhouse or vertical farm on earth customized to the local market. So very exciting way we're trying to disrupt. And our mission with Agriculture Designer in the short term is to help launch 1,000 new farms, and then beyond that, even more. And we're gonna be building models for soil-based agriculture, aquaponics, mushroom agriculture as well. So here's a little bit of our journey, what we've been up to. And this is the impact to date, right? So now we're at 35 countries, and we just passed 150 consultations around the world. And for me as a global citizen, I was born in Hong Kong, and I grew up in Hong Kong, Tokyo, Germany, Czech Republic, and Russia, all before the age of 18. It's a real honor for me to work across the world with so many different types of clients and different kinds of markets. But this really gives us a unique global outlook that I think gives us an edge to really fulfill our mission, which as I said, is to help society adapt to climate change through the localization and resilience in agriculture. So let's get down to business. Let's talk about the topic, right? How climate change is impacting cities and their food security. I'm gonna prepare some, I'm gonna share some case studies and then sort of talk about some solutions as we get through this. So the first one is Paris, France. Beautiful city, incredible place for food, but in the face of climate change, it's got quite a few challenges ahead of it. In particular, the extreme heat that is occurring in the summers in Europe is really affecting France and Paris. In fact, since 2003, 15,000 people have been killed by heat waves in France alone. Just think about that. These are typically older people. These are people who are vulnerable. And you know, these cities like Paris have not been designed to necessarily handle extreme heat. If you look in Europe, many households don't have air conditioning because they have more reasonable climates. It doesn't get so extreme. Well, that is changing now. And so what Paris has done is they've made a commitment to develop 300 hectares of green space in Paris. And of that 30 hectares of it would be urban agriculture. They did this through the Paris Culture program, which allows entrepreneurs to find sites throughout the city and develop urban farms. And you're saying, well, how does this connect to heat waves? Well, when we create this sort of green infrastructure as it's called, imagine converting rooftops 
to green urban farms, rooftop farms. That actually helps to maintain the temperature of the buildings and the nearby area, reducing the heat island effect that occurs, which allows the temperature to avoid getting to that extreme. So this is one of the key challenges that urban agriculture can solve, but this is one of the key challenges that's already affecting cities due to climate change today. New York City, an incredible city where actually I founded Agritecture, it's where our headquarters is, and I lived there for eight and a half years. New York City is very populated, very dense, and very innovative, but lacks a lot of agriculture. In fact, when Hurricane Sandy hit New York City, there was an analysis that if it had just gone a couple miles elsewhere, it would have hit Hunts Point, which is the world's largest food distribution hub. So all of the food that goes to the Eastern Seaboard, including New York City, typically goes through Hunts Point. It's quite an incredible operation, but it's a centralized operation that's very much at risk due to climate change and these storms. New York City is estimated to only have two days of food if the food stops coming in through Hunts Point and other access points. Can you think, imagine that, right? Only two days worth of food. So these cities which consume all of our food, most of our food, 80% of our food is consumed in cities. Almost none of them have plans to protect their food system. In addition to this challenge, there's also challenges with food access. Since COVID, poverty has increased in New York City and part of that is access to food. So one of the main issues that has happened is that one in four children are now going hungry in New York City. Wow. This is one of the wealthiest, most populated cities on earth. And this is a terrible statistic. And why is it happening? Partially because children weren't going to school where they had access to free lunches. And many of those children who are in poverty lack that access due to COVID. But that doesn't mean the problem is gone once COVID is gone. In fact, those youth and those children are lacking sufficient nutrition. And there's a lot of solutions that are needed to that. And I'll present some examples as well. <laughs> Let's go over to the Middle East. Now, Dubai has grown so rapidly into a global mega power of services and experiences. It really is the leading city in the Middle East now for many, many years. But the challenge is that 80% of its food is imported. So that means that in the face of pandemics and climate change, that supply is at threat. And so it, it, it lacks the food security that it needs to grow in the future. It's important that populations feel food secure and policymakers have to have a role in this. Now, Dubai is doing quite a bit of work in this. They're building a, something called the Food Tech Valley, which is set to open in 2024, which is essentially a food hub for all things product, productive agriculture and food tech. They also developed a ministry of food security a few years ago, which is directly focused on improving its location on the food security index. And it actually has a lot of new vertical farms and greenhouses that have been developing. So these are real challenges that these are that real cities are facing today. And you know what's really interesting about climate change is some scientists say that the effects of climate change we're feeling now are due to impacts we made on the environment through uh, greenhouse gas emissions 10 years earlier. So even if we stopped everything right now, we've got another 10 years of problems ahead of us even if we stopped emitting carbon. So these problems are not going away, they're gonna get worse and we need to act now on solving them. So it's accelerating as I mentioned, and I think that there's a clear understanding that we are not prepared. As the UN IPCC report states, this is a code red for humanity. And we've taken it on to make it our mission to do our part to help society adapt to this. And I think it's also really interesting just to ask the question, how, how did we get here? And I think part of the question, part of the issue is that we've sort of defined cities as these glitzy places of economic development and nice places to live. And we've decided that agriculture isn't for cities, right? We've said, oh, you know, none of our parents probably raised us and said, you should be a farmer. Certainly my parents, when I told them I was going into agriculture, they said, oh my gosh, all this work, all this education we gave you, and you wanna go into agriculture? We want you to be a lawyer or a, a doctor. And this is part of the problem is we have a cultural mismatch, right? We don't raise our youth. We don't create the culture of agriculture in cities. And that's a real problem. And I think it's interesting to ask ourselves, especially in the context of the smart cities discussion or the resilient cities discussion, can a, can a city really be smart without agriculture? It can't. Think about this, okay? Think about 
all the sustainable urban technologies that are developing, right? There's solar panels, there's these smart electronic um, energy hubs, microgrids, all these various technologies, but there is no technology besides urban agriculture that embraces the nexus, the relationship between food, water, energy, and waste. And in order to unlock sustainable urban development, we need to understand those relationships. So beyond all the benefits of growing food in the city, like creating green jobs, growing food, potentially improving equity, potentially improving resilience, we also have this other benefit where we unlock an understanding, a new generation that can understand the relationship between these critical resources. That's why I think urban agriculture needs to be a focus of cities everywhere, not just for the food, but also for the added benefit I just mentioned. So vertical farming is one type of urban agriculture. It's a more high-tech form of urban agriculture that essentially lives in containers or warehouses or basements. And because it's indoors and doesn't have any sunlight, it does have certain downsides like using more energy, but it uses much less land, dramatically less land. In fact, you can stack these systems. Some of them have 52 times more productivity. Cubic Farms is one company that makes that claim. I'll be speaking at an event about their technology on October 21st, but there's also huge benefits in saving water. These systems use 95 or more percent water, according to many of the companies in the sector and our analysis. They also use no pesticides. They can be located in multiple different places, but they're very resilient to things like storms, hurricanes, and other issues. The climate can change, but as long as these farms are powered, they essentially can continue to go on forever. So if we think about farms in Dubai, et cetera, where the extreme heat is gonna get worse, vertical farming has a very particular presence. Now in New York City, for example, they import most of the, the leafy green products that are commonly grown in vertical farms from Arizona and California. So that journey of shipping also isn't sustainable and Arizona and California are getting hotter, experiencing more droughts. But the good news is that we're seeing huge growth in vertical farming and in urban agriculture in general, we're seeing that policymakers are getting behind it. Just yesterday, the city of New York passed a bill to build an urban agriculture uh, department, which is a huge, huge deal and something that our organization and our friends in New York City have been lobbying for for six years now. The city of Atlanta has an urban agriculture department as well, the city of Philadelphia, the city of DC, and Agritecture has just won an RFP to design the urban agriculture plan as part of the climate plan for the city of Dallas. In addition to these US cities, Dubai, Singapore, and Toronto all have bold initiatives in this, and I will say Montreal is also one of the leaders. So there is excitement and there is great potential here, but we have a long way to go still to improve these systems, the technologies, the economics, and also the policies that are going to foster them. So cities need to develop specific goals and scenarios. It's not enough just to say we want more urban farming, but it needs to be really connected to the problem and how the specific types of urban farming will solve that problem. So here are a couple different ways that cities can specifically solve these problems. This is a step-by-step -step process. Number one, it's important to survey, understand what is the context of the problem. So we talked about children not getting enough food in New York City. Are vertical farms gonna solve that problem? Well, it depends. A lot of vertical farms tend to have more expensive product. So we need to really look at what kind of urban farms would be better, soil-based ones, maybe greenhouses. What are the systems that are gonna work? I will say that Teens for Justice, which is an organization I'm a board member at, is based in New York City and builds vertical farms in classrooms for marginalized youth to build the farms, to operate the farms, grow the food, harvest the food, distribute it to their schoolmates, and even cook with it. And it's pretty incredible what they're doing with an expensive technology like vertical farming to solve issues of food access and food equity. But bottom line, every city has different needs. And so it begins with really understanding what those needs are. Who are the people that are having the biggest challenges? Who are the entrepreneurs that are trying to get in and what are the obstacles they're facing? What are the international companies that might be interested in contributing to economic development through urban agriculture? You get the idea. But it also is important to look at the available spaces, right? What educational institutions are there? What vacant spaces are available? What are the areas and real estate that might drive or, or strengthen or, or worsen the ability to develop urban agriculture? That's where it begins. Now, after the survey, step two is to really target the key impact areas. And I sort of said this already, but it's really about finding the right match, right? Some urban farms are better for certain kinds of impacts, 
while others are better for other kinds of impacts. So it really requires sort of thinking about the targets and running some scenarios on what's gonna make sense there. What is the key goal and difference you wanna make? That's part of what we're gonna be doing with this Dallas Urban Agriculture Plan. Number three, commitment. It's very important that policymakers, uh, I mean, they're very good at this, right? Talking, but it's important they make specific commitments. For example, if we look at Bill de Blasio, many, many years ago, he put in the one NYC plan. We wanna encourage vertical farms and urban farms, but no specifics, no details on how many or where or how, just sort of throwing the buzzwords into his plan for New York City. That's not okay. I'm talking about really specific commitments. And I think that we're getting there. And I think Paris has done that, right? We want, we want 30 hectares of urban farming space. Um, Singapore, I think they have a goal to have 50% self-reliance. Um, I think that there's the city of Naom in Saudi Arabia, 70% self-reliance in food. So these specific goals start to really create confidence in the market for investors, for entrepreneurs, for young people and students, and other policymakers to get behind this, and even education institutions. It's incredibly powerful when policymakers make specific commitments and create specific budgets for urban agriculture. Number four, creating pathways. What I find in most cities is that there's a lot of people like me and a lot of urban farmers that are really trying to get started and they just need a little bit of support. So when you create pathways for them to be successful, they sort of come out of the woodwork and suddenly you have all these people willing to get into it, willing to raise money, willing to get their hands dirty and develop these farms and feed the population in a resilient manner. And so when we create these pathways, it unlocks that energy from the city, which is very exciting. And one great example of this is our past client Square Roots, which is the vertical farming company that's doing incredible work across New York City and Michigan. But their first project was in Brooklyn. And we had the, the privilege of working with them to develop that. And I personally had the privilege of working on the recruiting plan to recruit 10 different entrepreneurs to operate 10 different shipping container vertical farms for one year. And these entrepreneurs had to actually put skid in the game. They had to take out loans, they had to show up, they had to grow the food, learn how to grow the food and distribute and sell it. Guess how many people applied for these positions? This is again, something they were not paid for. We had 480 applications. I interviewed 80 of them and we narrowed it down to 10. But that overwhelming energy was just one of many examples I've seen of what happens when you create space for people to get involved in this sector. People love urban agriculture and that can be a great economic development. And as I said, unlock that nexus of food, water, energy, and waste that cities need and also grow incredibly delicious, fresh food in the city. Number five, you need to foster. So this is about engaging and encouraging diverse communities. One of the key challenges across anything that involves policy or investment is that there's often communities that are left behind. And those are often the communities that need it the most. So it's very important that from the early stages, you invite people of color, women, youth, to be part of the conversation and contribute their ideas and their feedback. I think the Toronto Food Policy Council is one of the great examples of this. There's other tactics that you can use to engage the community and to listen to them, but it's very important that you really understand their needs because food is really connected to race, society, access and equity. And when you skip over that and you say, we're gonna build high-tech farms and we're not gonna really consider the community elements of it, you really are, are creating a mistake. In fact, you could create more problems than you had in the first place. So it's very important that you allow space and foster a community to develop around this. These communities can also be industry associations. Um, I co-founded the Association for Vertical Farming, which is a global association for vertical farming. I, I served in that role until 2017. And in that, I learned that actually a global organization isn't as good as a local one. And then I founded the NYC Ag Collective with fellow urban farmers in New York City. And that is part of the group that was able to lobby and get this bill passed for New York City. And so it's also about fostering communities to gather together and work together to share what they are feeling and what they need, whether that's industry groups or community groups, et cetera. Now, tracking is very important. This is number six. I like this again, I'm sort of skipping some of them. But number six is about tracking, right? So once you implement sort of plans, you need to make sure you're observing it. And this is a key part of sustainability. I think a lot of people think that sustainability is from A to B, right? So I'm going to start here. I'm going to be not sustainable. And then I'm going to be sustainable over here. In fact, it's more like a circle, right? It's a process of making a plan, implementing a strategy, observing that strategy, and going again. 
And so it's very, very similar in urban agriculture. You need to track how the plan is working. You need to have mechanisms in place to track those. Is it impacting our marginalized community? Right In Atlanta, 25% of Atlantans live in what's called food deserts. It's better to call it sort of like food apartheid or food um, access areas. But these, these individuals have to walk more than a mile to get fresh food. Now, if you're not solving that problem, then what's the point of your plan? So you need to survey those individuals. You need to visit them, talk to them, observe and track what's going on to optimize that policy over time. So those are the six ways for cities to basically embed urban agriculture and solve the problem. It's also important, I'd like to say this, that you know, urban and rural, it's important that they do connect, right? We're not gonna produce all the food we need in cities. There are some estimates that 10% of our global food supply is already being grown in cities. Now that's being encroached on as cities are developing on agricultural land in and near the city. So especially in the developing world, this is happening. But there's estimates that that 10% could be maintained with the right policies. There's also estimates that certain cities could produce 50% of that produce if they just look within 100 miles of their city. So it's very important that the connection between urban and rural, and especially that peri-urban area where the city ends and rural begins, are fostered and protected for agriculture. One interesting organization that's working on this is the Sustainable Urban Delta Foundation, which is run by Priva, a company that does controls for greenhouses and buildings. And Miney Prinzer, CEO, is really trying to encourage protecting green belts in cities and protecting these areas so that they have more resilience to climate change. Such a critical issue. So again, here are some ideas about how you can connect them, right? Workshops between rural farmers that have the experience of growing and urban entrepreneurs that are excited about technology and agriculture and probably have a better ability to raise money. When these two groups work together, there's a better vision of the food system and how they can work together to solve it. So I'll continue my presentation, but if you have questions, you can feel free to bring them up as we get through this. So incubators can be really powerful. At Agritecture, after the Square Roots experience, we saw there's all these people that still wanna get involved. Where is the space for them that didn't make the 10? So we just decided to start our own incubator called AgTechX in our office. And we created this really low entry way to just come and incubate ideas. So you could rent a desk by the day, the week, or the month, or you could rent an area of the office as a small team. And you could convene together with other farmers, other technologists, even policymakers. We had events, we had you know, mycelium education classes, aquaponics, we had vertical farming systems in our office. You can check out agtechx.com and you can investigate and see how we did that model. And I think this is a really great way, again, creating those pathways. And it's so simple. I mean, it's difficult to operate, but it's very simple to start by just creating a safe space to ask questions. When it comes to agriculture, so many of us don't know about it. You know, the United States, I think over 100 years ago, there was maybe 70% of the population involved in agriculture. Now it's less than 5%. So we're losing agricultural knowledge. So we really need to foster spaces that inform people and just get people talking about this and get people excited about it. And again, once you open up a space like this, just like Ag Tech X experienced, you're gonna be sold out. You're gonna have way too many people interested and you're gonna really see how that energy can cultivate some exciting companies. So let's talk about some cities that I think are doing a great job. First one is Singapore. Now, Singapore has such a critical need. They import 90% of their food. They're a small island state with almost no land to develop agriculture. So the Singapore Food Agency has developed a number of strategies. One of them is a very robust and large grant program, investment program for the sector attracting international companies to bring agriculture to the city. And this is everything from you know, plant-based meats to alternative proteins, to aquaculture, they've got a vertical crab farm there, they've got aquaponics, they've got rooftop farms, they're bringing everyone together. They've also created a master's program for urban ag tech, which I think is so cool, and I would love to just do that if I could be in school forever. And they also created an amazing portal where you can learn about this and a guideline for all of the aspects of developing a farm that you would need to know about. So you can get the information, right, about zoning, about investment, about hiring, about technologies. And this is a really great way to take that positive energy and move it in a responsible direction. So kudos to Singapore, keep an eye on them because there's gonna be a lot more moves coming up. One of the companies I advise and ever vertical farming is opening a huge vertical farm in Singapore. 
they won one of the grants that I mentioned. So keep an eye on that company. It was actually just acquired by Calera. So it's sort of Calera and Ever Vertical Farm if you wanna look that up. I mentioned Atlanta and you know, this was an exciting client for us. We worked with the city of Atlanta and their director of urban agriculture, Mario Cambardella for three years to develop the Aglanta brand. And this was really about how do we balance the needs of communities in, that are marginalized, that have food access issues with the exciting technology of hydroponic greenhouses and vertical farms. And so we wanted to create a space of diversity, a space where people could talk about this in an open way. We made commitments for a number of students to attend the annual event, Aglanta, which we produced for three years. And we helped develop a portal, which is essentially a food and agriculture hub for the city. Again, similar to the Singapore one, a place for people to find information. Since then, Atlanta has built this, the world's biggest urban food forest. This, what is a food forest? Well, it's a very diverse sort of forest full of food that people could go through and pick their own food and actually learn about the agricultural system. They also developed a grows a lot program where basically if there's a vacant lot in one of these food deserts as they call them, again, it's not the right term. It's more like a, a food apartheid area trying to improve my language. Um, and the reason I'm trying to do that is because food desert sort of says, you know, a desert, I've heard someone say a desert is actually a successful ecosystem, right? But in this context, these are failing ecosystems where people aren't getting enough food. So it's not really enough to call them a desert. And the reason you say apartheid is because typically these, these communities have been actually redlined or by urban planners and various race issues have been abandoned. So it, it's not the right way to, to say it. So I'm still improving my language. But anyway, if you have a vacant lot in these areas that you find, you can actually get that access to that land for free and develop an urban farm, create a business and feed your community. So definitely go to aglanta.org if you wanna check out all the initiatives happening there. Pariculture I mentioned, and I think it just has to be mentioned again, this is the competition that Paris did. And I had the pleasure of advising in the early stages, the deputy mayor of Paris on this project, as well as being a judge for one of the years. And so when they unlocked these sites across the city, they work with developers and they say, hey, we wanna list you, we'll promote what you're doing, but you have to give a free lease to these urban farmers for some unused space in your property. So they had government buildings and they also had for-profit private buildings. It's incredible what's it's kicked off. I mean, they've achieved 16 hectares of their 30 hectare goal in less than five years, which is just incredible for a city with Paris that has a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of historical buildings. And so it's been very, very impressive. And you can definitely check out the Pariculture program on their website. And there's a map of all the projects out there. And a lot of them are soil-based, right? Again, because of that heat island effect I mentioned earlier, Paris is encouraging the right kinds of urban farms. But there's also some really cool ones like underground parking garages that have been converted to grow endives and mushrooms and have composting facilities. It's really such a vibrant scene. And I can't wait to go back to Paris to see what they are up to. So let's talk a little bit about how agritechnology can help you be part of the solution and part of helping cities adapt. Well, first we offer a range of services. If you're looking for consulting, we do these services to entrepreneurs through a feasibility study methodology. We essentially accelerate your urban farming idea. We provide concept development, site analysis, farm design, market research, economic modeling, everything you would need to feel confident about starting your farm. And that's a very popular service of ours. We also do due diligence for investors looking to invest in some of these farms and help them understand the risks with that and help them move through some of the BS that is out there. We also provide industry and market research and strategy for different corporates. We helped IKEA investigate and, and analyze their global strategy for vertical farming and urban agriculture. Keep an eye on them, they're doing some incredible work. And obviously through our blog, we also do some promotion and education services as well. And you can see our whole portfolio on our website. One of the things I wanted to tell you about today was Agriculture Designer, which is the software I mentioned at the beginning of our presentation that helps you build models for greenhouses and vertical farms. And eventually we wanted to have all kinds of urban farms in there. And so the way it works, you sort of input information about your site and what you wanna do, and you get a report about the economics of that, how many jobs, how many people you could feed, and you get it in a number of minutes. All you need to do is input your location, your local labor rates, your local energy rates, and some idea of the crops you wanna grow that you can source from our crop portfolio, which is 75 of the most popular crops for urban agriculture in there. And again, this is part of our mission, right? We wanna be honest, we wanna be transparent. So we're trying to disrupt 
and remove the barriers that a lot of people have when they're thinking about urban agriculture. That's what Agriculture Designer is about. I invite you to check it out. You can even start for free and just answer 10 questions and it'll recommend three farms that are similar to your idea that are real existing farms that you can research more about that. You can sign up for free and you can even preview some of the premium options on there. We are also very committed to sustainability. And in recent years, we've noticed that a lot of urban farms are not communicating very well about sustainability. So we're taking that challenge head on with our new sustainability commitments, which you can see at agriculture.com slash sustainability. But one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to gather more data and benchmark sustainability. So you heard me say some things about using less land or using less water or using no pesticides. These are all different sustainability claims. And you know they're mostly true, but let's get more into the details. Let's be more accurate. So our census, which is happening now, it's what actually is completed. We're working on the report. This is the third time we've done it. And we're really excited because the farms that participated are going to be able to log in and see how their sustainability metrics that they presented stack up against all of the other 400 that submitted. So that's a very, very exciting thing. And stay tuned for that report. But you can also look at the previous year's censuses, which are the biggest in the sector, at agriculture.com slash census. So that's it. That's all I've got for you today. If you're interested in reaching out to me, you can. Well, let's dive into some of your questions if you have them, and let's see what we got in the Q&A or the chat, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Henry. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I haven't seen yeah, ask any, away. <laughs> any in the Q&A yet. Um, but one, one thing, first of all, when you're, you know, talking about cities, I was wondering how you see the implementation of this. Will, will it be partly on roofs in like condominiums shared by the people who live there or individual solutions for, you know, a family that wants to do it, or will there be like big farming companies that set up spaces in the city and produce there and then sell? Uh, how do you see the implementation of this? It, it, how is it going to happen? Wow, there are so many exciting different ways to implement urban agriculture. And again, I think it's really about choosing the right selection, but I'll give you some examples. There's a real estate development in Staten Island, and in the middle of it, they built an urban farm and they hired an urban farmer and the community can get some of that food. They pay a subscription every month, and then the urban farmer can sell the rest of it. We have a rooftop farm in the Bronx, it's on a lead platinum uh, affordable housing building, and it's actually a greenhouse that can grow produce year round. And it has part of its commitment, 10% of the produce needs to go at cost or for free to the residents in the building. And so those are two sort of real estate examples. We have other radical examples like Aqua Arc, which is a client of ours that's working on a four acre floating greenhouse next to Hunts Point to help improve some of that resilience as well. Imagine that, a floating greenhouse in New York City, that would be exciting. There is actually a floating farm in Rotterdam called the Floating Farm that is also part of this idea and may actually be working on that project as well. There's also basements. Farm One is one of our clients and they grow in a vertical farm in a basement and they serve Michelin star restaurants and also deliver through reusable packaging to residents all across New York City. Brooklyn Grage is a rooftop soil-based farm. That's another popular integration. We also have certain farms in schools. I think in New York City, there's over 700 school gardens. These are very impactful as well. You also have people at home. If we look at AgriLution, Max Loso, who co-founded the Association for Vertical Farming with me, his company is AgriLution. They produce a sort of really high-end, beautiful, um, sort of like a mini fridge that goes in your kitchen that grows microgreens and small herbs that you can then pull it out and cook with it directly and that's called the Plant Cube, and that was just recently acquired by Miele. You also have other projects that include sort of community farms, as I mentioned, where they collaborate together, or community groups are building these, greenhouses as well. There's also large scale greenhouses on the outsides of cities or warehouse vertical farms like Bowery. There's really so many examples. And again, if you wanna get an idea of these examples, you can go to architecture designer, design.agriculture.com, Fill in the first questionnaire and you'll get three examples that are real, that you can look at that are similar to the budget or the crop or the type of business you wanna run. Right. And is this food, uh, like if it's in a, in a building, in a condominium, is it the food is, is sold or it's given to the residents? Typically, if there's been an incentive for the, so urban farmers can't pay the same real estate that a commercial or residential customer could. So there's typically a deal that happens between the developer and the urban farmer. 
And urban farms are known to increase the real estate value of the area around them. That's already proven. So that's part of the negotiation. But if there's a community need, there typically is a percentage of the product, either for the residents or for the community that is given away or sold at cost. So uh-huh. in the case of Sky Vegetables, it's 10%. It either has to be sold at cost, meaning no profit, or has to be given away. So whenever there's excess product, it's just given away to the residents in sort of a farm stand um, below. And there's very similar models to that around. Right. And one last question, um, how do you see, I mean, these changes clearly are essential and inevitable given you know, climate change and all the sustainability issues. What is, what's gonna happen to the big farmers? Mm. So many thousands of farmers who depend on the, the, the current system, you know, growing, shipping, selling, and you know, things like from farm to table and stuff like that. How do you see their future and the big companies? Yeah, there's a couple different ways to think about that. I think the first thing is that, you know, we're expecting another 2 billion people on this planet. So we need to produce more food. Um, In addition to the increase of the population, there's billions of people coming out of poverty. And so they're expecting more food and higher quality food. So really, we have a big gap that all of the major companies, all of the major policymakers, and all of the urban farmers are really concerned about filling. So I don't think it's going to be that urban farms are putting other farms out of business. I think it's going to complement the system. There's another way that it could complement the system. For example, we have declining interest in agriculture in general. The average age of the U.S. farmer, I believe, is 59. You see similar numbers in Europe and, and all across the developed world. We also see data that farms are being consolidated. So where typically there were a lot of small farms in the developed world, there's starting to be more big farms. If you look at the U.S. data, we're seeing the size of farms go up. And that's because as farmers are getting older, they're not selling it to their children or giving it to their children who have moved to the city. In fact, they're going to sell it to a big agricultural company. And that's problematic because those big agricultural companies tend to produce in a monoculture way. They don't have a lot of transparency. There's a lot of different labor issues. There's a lot of pesticide use. And so that's a problem for the food system. And so urban farms actually kind of are this incubator for the food system overall, right? Because you can imagine if you start an urban farm and you're successful, you're gonna wanna go bigger, but there's always an inability to go too big in the city. So if we look at square roots, some of the graduates of that first cohort there actually ended up learning so much about agriculture that they decided not to build an urban farm after they finished the program. They actually wanted to go and work on a soil-based farm in upstate New York. And there's really interesting work happening of having farmers in New York, New York State and also in Massachusetts matched with young people in the city. They're excited about agriculture. They get trained by the older farmers and there's sort of this transition that's occurring. And I think that is something to be very excited about and, and very positive about. And that's what I mean by that urban-rural relationship. So I think we're catching up with 30 years, is what the data says, of consolidation of farms and decline of interest in agriculture. And the fact that technology and urban agriculture is excited this again is our opportunity, our time to connect those two systems together. I didn't talk much about that. And you know, and you, you can see from our map, we don't have any clients in Latin America. We've gotten a lot oh, of yeah. leads, but we just, we just haven't had any clients. But I can give you some um, examples. So we are seeing that in recent years, vertical farming is on the rise. Um, in Latin America, an uh, area where typically urban farms have not been, well, vertical farms have not been very popular. That's because vertical farms are very capital intensive. So it's very difficult for many people to do that. There's also a pretty good climate in Latin America. So there's a lot of other ways to grow. But we are seeing vertical farms in Brazil and Argentina, uh, certainly in Mexico, starting to sprout up. So it's definitely happening there. And I certainly hope to be part of that. There's also a um, very interesting project that won the World Food Prize recently, I believe, in Lima, Peru. And Lima, Peru is basically a city in a desert and has huge, huge issues with poverty and climate change. And so in Lima, Peru, this um, individual, who, who I forgot the name, unfortunately, but we can look up Lima, Peru World Food Prize. Um, they developed a really novel way, a system for people at home to grow some greens and then even grow these small sort of um, guinea pig animals that people actually eat in Peru. And so it's a way of creating almost micro animal husbandry uh, in the city, which I think was a really, really cool solution to impact not only vegetables and nutrition, but also the protein that people need to have a healthy life. So those, those are some of the examples that I can highlight there. Um, I wish I could give you more, but that's, that's my start. Thank you for the question. I want to, Henry, thank you so much for 
your time, for your explanations, your presentation. Uh, there's so much potential there. You can, you can imagine all these things like changing the world. Uh, and we're very proud to have you as part of uh, the One Sustainability Series. So thank you very much. And thank you so much, we'll James. Really appreciate it. It's, it's great. Great. Thank you.